it looks like it might rain today. So I'm just going to feed my friends here and cut this intro short. Today's episode will be a continuation on the theme about the Scythians, their ancient origins, and the influence of their lineage on history, which continues until this day. The Merovingian dynasty was the ruling family of the Franks from the middle of the 5th century until 751. Their royal bloodline emerging as the King of the Franks, a group of Germanic people whose name was first mentioned in 3rd century Roman sources, but along with other Germanic tribes that I mentioned in my last video, stemmed from Scythians or Aryans that penetrated into Europe from Anatolia. If you haven't seen it yet, I'll leave a link in the description. It's called History of the Royal Dragon Bloodline, and their ancient symbol was the dragon, which comes down to us in legends of invading dragons in European mythology. When we look up the etymology of the word dragon, we find that it says, from Old French dragon, and directly from Latin draconum, or draco, meaning huge serpent, and from Greek dracon, meaning serpent, giant, sea fish. But then it also says it stems from Durkishtai, to see clearly, and from Proto-Indo-European, Durk, to see. In Sanskrit, visible. In Old Irish, I have seen. Old English and Old High German, light, clear. And Albanian, which linguistically is very close to the original Proto-Indo-European, and means light, then it goes on to say, perhaps in the literal sense, it's the one with the deadly glance. That's interesting, and conjures up the ancient symbol that is most commonly referred to as the evil eye, which is famous all over the Mediterranean since ancient times, spanning much of what has once been the Phoenician Empire, colonies, and trade routes. In Hebrew, dragon translates to tannin, a great sea monster. Which brings us back to the Merovingians, whose name is said to derive from Merovi, king of the Franks. According to the legend, Merovi had two fathers, King Clodion and a strange beast of the sea. The Druidic title of Pendragon, which means High Dragon, or King of Kings, was passed on to the Merovingian kings in 666 AD. In Bloodline of the Holy Grail, Lawrence Gardner says, quote, Despite the carefully listed genealogies of his time, the heritage of Merovius was strangely obscured in the monastic annals. Although the rightful son of Clodion, he was nonetheless said by historians Priscus to have been sired by an arcane sea creature, the Bisti Neptunus. The Cimbrian Franks, from whose female line the Merovingians emerged, were associated with the Grecian Arcadia before migrating to the Rhineland. As we have seen, they call themselves the Numage, people of the New Covenant, just as the Essenes of Qumran had once been known. It was the Arcadian legacy that was responsible for the mysterious sea beast, the Bisti Neptunus, as symbolically defined in the Merovingian ancestry. The relevant sea lord was King Pallas, a god of old Arcadia. The immortal sea lord was said to be ever incarnate in the dynasty of ancient kings, whose symbol was a fish, as was the traditional symbol of Jesus. This sea creature represents Neptune, the god of the sea in mythology, who is said to have founded Atlantis, which is the pagan version of the pre-flood civilization which God judged in Genesis, and it describes the intermarriage of mankind with the sons of gods. Quote, and it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men of which were of old men of renown. It implies that the serpent seed continues after the deluge 
through Noah's Caucasian descendants, with the serpent being perceived in different ways depending on the civilization, as even Jesus is said to have referred to serpents as wise. The legend of King Morovi seems to conceal the true origins of the Merovingian race in remote antiquity. Morovius derives from the French words mer, meaning sea, and ver, meaning werewolf or dragon. The book of Revelation informs us that the dragon is the devil and Satan. Yet the Hebrew word Satan means an adversary or one who resists. So again, what should be considered is from whose perspective is the story being told. This helps to explain the esoteric allusion to the Merovingians' progenitor, King Morovi, a king of France sired by a mysterious beast of the sea, and the claim that the Merovingian dynasty is of literally satanic descent. In the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the authors tell us, quote, there are at least a dozen families in Britain and Europe today with numerous collateral branches who are of Merovingian lineage. These include the House of Habsburg, Lorraine, Planter, Luxembourg, Montague, and various others. According to the pre-war documents, the Sinclair family in Britain is also allied to the bloodline, as are various branches of the Stuarts. In many of its documents, the Scion asserts that the new king, in accordance with the Merovingian tradition, would rule but not govern. In other words, he would be a priest king who functions primarily in a ritual and symbolic capacity, and the actual business of governing would be handled by someone else, conceivably by the Priory de Sion. After the Merovingian dynasty was deposed by the Roman Church in 800 AD, their bloodline was preserved by the imperial and royal dragon court, which conspired to regain control of the Holy Roman Empire through infiltration of church and state. Their insignia was a dragon in the form of a circle and a red cross, the rosy cross of the Priory de Sion, the Knights Templar, and the Rosicrucians. King Sigismund of Luxembourg was King of Hungary and Croatia from 1387, King of Germany from 1411, King of Bohemia from 1419, King of Italy from 1431, and Holy Roman Emperor from 1433 until 1437, and the last male member of the House of Luxembourg. When he reconstituted the imperial and royal dragon court in 1408, called the Societas Draconis, it was based upon the ancient bloodline tradition he had inherited from his presumed Egyptian and Scythian ancestors through the royal house of Vir of Anjou. This line had descended on one side through the Tutha de Danin, or the dragon kings of Anu, who come down to us in myth as a race of fairies, and not in a metaphysical context, but an actual race of people that settled Ireland from around 800 BC, as well as the Black Sea Scythian princes from around modern Ukraine, which I covered in my last video, and identified as synonymous with the Aryans, and the Egyptian dragon dynasty of Sobek, who is the crocodile god portrayed as a crocodile-headed man with the headdress of feathers and a sun disk, known as Sukos in Greek, associated with pharaonic power, fertility, present in the ancient Egyptian pantheon from the Old Kingdom through the Roman period. This Egyptian lineage, incidentally, included the bloodline of the Davidic house of Judah, who married into the Merovingian kings of the Franks. In the book Holy Grail Across the Atlantic, author Michael Bradley says, quote, There was a very great Jewish component among the Sicumbrian Franks, Merovingians, and because they practiced polygamy, they left a great number of offspring. These aristocratic Merovingian children married into almost all of the noble families of Europe during the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries. This has prompted more than one historian to suggest that the foundation of European nobility is Jewish. According to Nicholas de Vere, author of The Dragon Legacy, members of the dragon court would often wear the insignia of a dragon curved into a circle with a red cross, the same emblem of the original rosy cross, which had identified the grail succession from before 3000 BC. Quote, it is just possible that in the Merovingians, 
we may have a dynasty of Germanic Hyrkanage, which means army kings or military leaders, derived from an ancient kingly family of the migration period. The princedoms of Vir are actually cultural manifestations of genetic qualities carried in the historical elven blood royal. Established in Angiers in 740 as a royal house arising from far older sacral, regal, Pictish, Scythian Vir origins rooted in antiquity, the House of Vir is recorded in a single name and in an unbroken line for over 1,300 years and consequently is one of the oldest surviving royal dynasties in Europe. The House of Vir are descended in numerous lines from the Merovingian dynasty and consequently share in this ancient Germanic royal blood tradition. Here's Nicholas de Vir in his own words. What is the significance of the dragon symbolism, symbolizing, I guess, the origin of this race and, and the source of the power that it represents? I, I remember you saying in your book that you can trace that back to the um, Sumerian figure of Tiamat, the original dragon goddess or, who sort of represented the chaos out of which the universe was created. Yeah. What does it mean to you exactly? The symbol of the dragon. Yes, in connection to what you're doing. Transcendent consciousness. Okay. The ability to uh, clear the mind. Let's have a look at the word dragon. The word dragon uh, comes from the Greek edrakon, which is what they call an aorist, or a verb that hasn't got a past, present, or future tense. It's just a verb of the word dakesthai, which is a word which simply means to see clearly. Now, that means that the word dragon simply means one who sees clearly. The idea of kingship, or the word, let's have a look at the word king. King means to see clearly. So that, and dragon means to see clearly. So therefore, dragon king is um, is a bit of a tautology, really, because dragon and king are the same thing, or dragon and prince, the first. The symbol of dragon, for me, represents, firstly, you have that, the serpentine quality of it, which has always been associated with healing, with the spinal column and the cerebral cortex and so on. Secondly, as a serpentine figure with wings, it shows that uh, that healing power or the, the healing of the mind has transformed the individual who now has a higher overview of life through clarity than perhaps other people do. And this is why they were chosen as kings and this is why through social engineering for millennia it was hoped to ensure that that clarity of vision would become hereditary. That's what the symbol t means to me. The stories of your ancestors, the oldest ones, you know, the ones that I guess could be identified with the gods of the ancient world, seems like, and I'm just generalizing a whole lot, because it, we're talking about different figures from all sorts of different cultures throughout history, yeah. but in general we see the same themes in the myths surrounding these figures that the original race that they came from, the original royal race, is something beyond what we consider to be human now, and uh, yeah. that they came from some sort of other world, something that isn't the earth that we know today, that they, they had some sort of transcendent quality to them that was non-earthly and non-human, is that correct? Yes. We are doing research now, Mark Pinkham and I, into the origins of the Anunnaki way back nearly 40,000 years now, 10,000 years before the uh, hybridization of humanity, to possibly the Kashmir. They seem to be linked very, very closely with the sons of Shiva, or the Jats, um, of whom the main king was uh, Sanat Kumrai, who seems to be the first grail king in human form, so to speak. The place that Shiva came to earth, which is very much like the falling to earth of Lucifer, was in what they now call Shangri-La with this otherworldly uh, situation but for our people we have always been associated with Shangri-La the Elysian Fields mm -hmm. um, Arcadia Tiana Nog and Wind which is basically death for the other world the Principality of Wales features a red dragon and we know the British royal family is of Germanic origins we also see the dragon on the flag of the Qing Dynasty, the first national flag of China, as well as the flag of Moscow in the Russian Federation, which shows St. George stabbing a dragon with a golden lance. Of course, there's a dragon on the flag of Bhutan, 
a Buddhist kingdom on the Himalaya's eastern edge, bordered by Tibet, and known for its monasteries, fortresses, and visits by the Ananarbe in the 1930s, the ancestral heritage anthropology branch of the German nationalists, who conducted research into ancient Aryan archaeology around the world, finding archaeological evidence in places like Tibet, as well as the mummies of the Canary Islands, and ultimately linking them to a forgotten global civilization of Atlantis during the Pleistocene, or Ice Age, which settled in Anatolia after a major deluge, and re-established civilization there, spreading out again to other parts of the world as their nobility. That said, it is these Aryan tribes that went by many names, including Scythians, that migrated into Europe in several waves, becoming the Druids, and intermarrying with the royal families and becoming sovereigns, the royal dragon bloodline. The house of Dracul, or Dracula, which means dragon, and that Prince Charles claims direct lineage, descended from Attila the Hun and was established in Central Europe by the sons of Genghis Khan. So the Druid kings were descended from Scythian royalty and later became the Merovingian dynasty, which eventually converted to Christianity. Even after their conversion to Christianity, the Merovingian rulers, like the patriarchs of the Old Testament, were polygamous, particularly with their own bloodline. This ancient use of polygamy in a royal family and occult sex magic is very ancient, as the Scythian line also stretches back into ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia, as this same bloodline was not only that of the pharaohs, but also the Anunnaki, which means those of royal blood, or the serpent seed, or princely noble seed. Which brings us to Robert de Bruce, who was far more than an early Scottish king, but was high-born Merovingian, priest-king of the Celtic Church, liberator of Scotland from England, sovereign grandmaster of the Order of the Knights Templar, and founder of the Order of the Rosy Cross. According to Prince Michael Stuart, author of The Forgotten Monarchy of Scotland, quote, in 1307, under the auspices of Robert de Bruce and the excommunicated clergy, the order was restructured into a church with a hierarchy quite independent of Rome. The Templar church had abbots, priests, and even bishops. The knights began to train the army of Robert de Bruce in the hit-and-run tactics of warfare established in the Crusades. The Roman church may have betrayed the Templars, but in Scotland they found something far more trustworthy and tangible a sacred royal house and a priest-king of the Celtic Church succession. The King of Scots was installed as a hereditary sovereign grandmaster, and from that time, whichever descending king held that office, he was to be known as Saint Germain. A new order was then formed called the Elder Brothers of the Rosy Cross, and several of the Rosy Cross knights then sailed to France for a meeting with Pope John XXII at Avignon. Many historians have presumed, therefore, that the Knights Templar must have disbanded in Scotland, but this was not the case. It was simply that Bruce had contrived the secret order to become even more secretive. Indeed, the Order of the Knights of the Rosy Cross had been established by Bruce for Templars who had been valiant at Bannockburn, and this was a very successful cover. The Merovingian dynasty still maintains its legitimacy, and according to members of the organization, will one day openly assert the divine right of their nobility to rule the world as an angelic race of demigods whose ancestors, they claim, were the fallen angels. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon. My books make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts, so please don't forget to leave a comment below. Have a great weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.